Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture seven. And in this segment, we're going to introduce something called the gradient flow pattern or the gradient wind balance. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So the definition of the gradient wind balance is a balance between, again, just like geostrophic, it is strictly a force balance, meaning the net acceleration and the net force is zero. So a gradient wind is a force balance between the pressure gradient force, the Coriolis force, and the centrifugal force. So unlike the geostrophic balance where we neglect where we uh, disregard uh, curved flow pattern, where we don't worry about curved flow, now we're going to start worrying about uh, flow that is in fact curving, is not traveling perfectly straight. So again, geostrophic balance is for straight flow, and that's going to be a balance between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. Now with the gradient wind balance, we're going to start worrying about a balance between pressure gradient force and Coriolis force for curved flow patterns, which means we're going to also account for the centrifugal force. And in this case, uh, well, we're going to take a look at a case that's primarily centered around, let's say, a 500 millibar uh, wave train or wave pattern. So uh, here, we'll come back to the same graphic a little bit later on, but I just want to go ahead and sort of illustrate what exactly we're trying to accomplish here. So in the real atmosphere, the flow is almost never straight. It is usually some degree of curvature present in the flow pattern. So that means we have to account for uh, we have to account for this uh, curvature in the flow pattern. And it's also, as we'll see, the reason the curvature is also the reason why we get rising and sinking motion at various levels throughout the atmosphere. But again, we'll talk more about that in greater detail later on, just giving you sort of a preview of what's to come. So if we were to draw an arrow that sort of represents the wind pattern at this particular point in time, technical term for this is a streamline, which we'll also talk about a little bit later on. But you can see how the flow pattern here is very, very much curved. There, it's not very straight. Well, maybe here. In fact, here, it's you can sort of think of it as being straight. There's not much curvature here, but there is a great deal of curvature in the flow pattern as it's going from west to east through this uh, wave train that's depicted on the screen here. So now we're going to try and sort out, from a conceptual standpoint, what exactly happens to our force balance when we introduce centrifugal force into, uh, or we start thinking about curved flow, which means we have to introduce centrifugal force into our thinking. So let's take a look at sort of an idealized example. So we'll take a look at, uh, say, a point or an air parcel that's in the base of a trough, which is an area of lower pressure. And we'll take a look at a point in the apex of a ridge. A ridge is an area of relatively high pressure. And we'll also take a look at a point that's uh, in between the trough base and the ridge apex. And right around here, we can actually sort of think of this as being a straight flow pattern because the you notice how the height contours tend to curve a lot in the low and in the high. And at this interface between the low and the high, the height contours are pretty straight. So that therefore, we stand a reason that our flow pattern is also going to be relatively straight so we can Think of that particular point, think of this particular point at the interface between the two, we can sort of think of that as geostrophic balance. But if we start drawing force balances, if we have uh, an area of lower pressure to the north, then that means the pressure gradient force is going to point to the north. And if we have an area of higher pressure to the south, that means the pressure gradient force is going to point to the north here as well. So we get a force balance that looks like this. So the pressure gradient force is going to point this direction. A relatively high pressure over here, relatively low pressure over here, so the pressure gradient force will point to the northwest at the interface between the two. Now in order to balance that, we have to have a Coriolis force that's pointing in the opposite direction, just like before. So here we have, in order for this to be consistent, in order for this to actually be, uh, be a force balance, the Coriolis force has to point in this direction and uh, towards the south here, towards the south up here, and towards the southeast at the interface between the two. And the only way that the, in the northern hemisphere at least, the only way that the Coriolis force can point this way is if the wind is traveling from west to east in the base of the trough, from the west to east in the apex and the ridge, and from the southwest to the northeast at the interface between the two. That's the only way the Coriolis force can point in this direction. So we get something like what looks like this. Now this is where things get a little bit interesting. That's when we start taking into account the curvature of the flow. So again, just to refresh your memory on the sign convention for radius of curvature, since we have counterclockwise radius of curvature, we have positive curvature in the base of the trough and negative curvature in the base of the in the base of the ridge since it's in a clock going in a clockwise direction. That's just a sign convention that we define when we introduce the idea of radius of curvature in lecture five. So now, since we have this curved flow, we have to account for the centrifugal force. And remember, centrifugal force points away from the center of the circle. So in the base of the trough, if our circle looks something like this, the centrifugal force must point from the lower pressure to the higher pressure. So it's pointing in the same direction as the Coriolis force. 
in the ridge, in the apex of the ridge, here the circle, uh, pointing away from the circle would mean pointing from south to north, which means our centrifugal force in the base or in the apex of the ridge is pointing in the same direction as the pressure gradient force. So if we have an extra, so let's take a look at the base of the trough here. If we have an extra force that's pointing in the direction of the Coriolis force, the pressure gradient force is still the same. The only way that we can still have a force balance is if the Coriolis force and, and the centrifugal force are both weaker than what's currently depicted on the screen here. So if let's say the pressure gradient force was two newtons per kilogram. That means that the com combined total of the Coriolis force and the centrifugal force must be two newtons per kilogram as well. That means centrifugal plus Coriolis must be two newtons per kilogram. So that means that both Coriolis and centrifugal must be weaker than the pressure gradient force when viewed separately. When viewed together, they should balance each other out. And then over here in the apex of the ridge, now you have a centrifugal force that points in the same direction as a pressure gradient force. And the only way that we can maintain a force balance here, because we have two forces pointing to the north, one force pointing to the south, the only way that we can maintain a force balance here is if this Coriolis force is much stronger than what's currently depicted on the screen here. So if the Coriolis force is weaker here in the base of the trough, that means the wind also has to be weaker. Because remember, Coriolis force and centrifugal force both depend on how fast the wind is moving. If Coriolis force is weak, that means the wind has to be weak. Over here, we have a stronger Coriolis force than what's being currently depicted. So that means the wind has to be stronger than what's currently depicted in the apex of the ridge. And over here, there's no curvature, so this is just geostrophic balance. In fact, you'll see a little subscript G got added here. So again, based on the logic that we went through, the fact that the Coriolis force must be weaker, that means the wind must be weaker in the base of the trough, and the fact that the Coriolis force must be stronger than what's currently depicted in the, or what would what you would normally expect from a geostrophic balance, the fact that the Coriolis force must be stronger than that also means that the wind has to be stronger than what's than you would expect from a geostrophic balance. So that will give you a flow pattern that looks something like this. Weak flow in the base of the trough, stronger flow in the apex of the ridge. And I'll also go ahead and demonstrate or introduce some terminology here. If a wind is moving slower than the geostrophic wind that we would expect, so if we were only worried about the balance between pressure gradient and Coriolis force, that would give us the geostrophic wind. But when we include centrifugal force, which again is part of our gradient wind balance, when we include centrifugal force, that weakens our wind in order to maintain the force balance. And since our wind here is blowing slower than what we'd expect from geostrophic balance, we call that a subgeostrophic wind. And on the flip side of that, here we have a wind that is moving faster than what we got from geostrophic balance. And the term for that is a super geostrophic wind. So if the wind is weaker than geostrophic, we call that subgeostrophic. If the wind is stronger or faster than geostrophic, we call that a super geostrophic wind. And that also, so if our, we have really strong wind here, very weak wind here, that means that the flow has to accelerate as it goes from the base of the trough to the apex of the ridge. And the fact that it accelerates is what causes what we refer to as upper level divergence. That causes divergence in the wind field. And when that occurs at some uh, upper level in the atmosphere, that in fact re results in rising motion. And again, we'll take a look at a diagram to help illustrate that a little bit later. I think that's in the next segment. And if we think about a continuous system here, so let's say we have a trough downstream of the ridge here. So we have really strong wind in the apex of the ridge and then the downstream trough or the trough that lies to the east, we have weak wind, so we have wind that decelerates as it goes from the apex of the ridge towards the base of the trough, and then same thing over here. So that'll result in upper level convergence, which is going to result in sinking motion. And if we take a look at a real world example, of this, so this is the same diagram that we introduced at the very beginning of the lecture. So here we have a nice intense trough here, and we have a bit of a ridge, not particularly well defined, but we do have a bit of a ridge here. So as the wind goes from the base of the trough to this little ridge here, it's going to accelerate, which is going to result in upper level divergence in this general area where the mouse cursor is, and that's going to result in rising motion. And then upstream of this trough, that is over here, we have another ridge. We have a wind that's going from the ridge to the base of the trough, and since it has to decelerate in the process, that's going to result in upper level convergence upstream of the trough. That's why a lot of surface highs are located upstream of the trough. That's going to result in sinking motion, which is given by the blue contour here. So ahead of the trough, 
rising motion because you have divergence aloft. And again, we'll illustrate this in greater detail later on. But upstream of the trough, we have sinking motion due to upper level convergence. So let's go ahead and take a look at an illustration of how exactly this all works. So if you think about a wind pattern that's diverging, meaning the wind is going away from some common point. So if you imagine, uh, imagine just where you're sitting, if the wind is all blowing away from your location, that means you've got a wind that's diverging. If you have divergence aloft, that means you have to have wind that's coming up from beneath it to come replace it in order for there to be a conservation of mass. And we'll establish a more mathematical basis of this emphasis on mathematical in the next lecture when we take a look at the mass continuity equation and we'll have some mathematical substantiation for what we're claiming here. But if you have divergence aloft, that means you've got to have wind coming up from beneath it to replace it. So that's going to give you rising motion or ascending motion. And if the wind is rising, that means that you've got to have convergence at the surface. So if you've got wind all blowing towards a common point at the surface, the wind can't go into the ground, so it's got to go up. The only There's only one place for that wind to go, and that's up. So that's why upper level divergence results in rising motion, and also why uh, convergence at the surface results in rising motion as well. And if we take a look at the flip side of that, if we have convergence aloft, we have air that's colliding at some upper level in the atmosphere, the wind can't go into the stratosphere, Technically, it can, but it can't get very far. So most of the wind's got to go down. So it, it have convergence aloft means we have descending motion or sinking motion wherever that convergence is taking place at some upper level in the atmosphere. In order to maintain continuity, that must mean we have high pressure at the surface or divergence at the surface. So if the wind is sinking, remember, it can't go into the ground. So once it hits the ground, it just spreads out and starts diverging away from a common point, which is usually the center of a high pressure or the center of an anticyclone. So this is sort of an illustration as to why surface convergence gives you rising motion, why divergence aloft gives you rising motion, and why convergence aloft gives you sinking motion, and why uh, divergence at the surface also gives you sinking motion. So that's going to do it for this lecture. So uh, like I said, in the next lecture, we'll take a look at the, we'll actually derive the mass continuity equation. We'll get more of a mathematical substantiation for what we're depicting here. So with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.